Well, I'd like to welcome you all here to hear my talk on iodine. I've been involved in an iodine project with my mentor, Dr. Abraham, for about eight years now. And I'm on my fourth edition of my book, Iodine, Why You Need It, Why You Can't Live Without It. The research on iodine is growing at exponential bounds. And I have found iodine to be the single most important substance that um, treats a variety of illnesses and helps people achieve their optimal health more so than any other substance that I've been involved with in holistic medicine over the last 16 years. So today we will run through um, the highlights of iodine, how you can use it, um, how it can help you achieve your optimal health, and why everybody needs to really take a critical look at iodine and how important it is for your family to ensure that they have adequate iodine levels. So I thank you for coming. and. Um, let's move on with it. So I'd like to start off with a quote by John Redmond Cox. Uh, he wrote this in 1800. The longer I live, the less confidence I have in drugs, and the greater is my confidence in the regulation and administration of diet and regimen. I couldn't agree with him more. We're in the middle of a health care crisis right now. Um, President Obama is proposing a $1 trillion overhaul to our, to our health care system, and I say all of the administration's responses and Congress's responses and the Republicans and Democrats are wrong. They're not focusing on health, they're focusing on a disease model. Um, nowhere in medical school was I taught about health, what is it, and how to maintain it. I was taught about disease, the diagnosis of pathology, and how to treat that single diagnosis with a drug. Um, I say unless we start focusing on health, uh, we are moving down the wrong road in health care. And whatever solution the administration, Congress, Republicans, Democrats come up with is going to be the wrong solution. Um, so this lecture will be about health, how to optimize it, how to maintain it, and specifically focusing on iodine. So this is my, my newest book, Iodine, Why You Need It, Why You Can't Live Without It. It's, it's in its fourth edition. Um, and um, I put in there the highlights of iodine and why it's become such an important part of my practice. And I'm sure you'll find the information very useful for your personal lifestyles. So this was my professor in medical school, um, Professor Vader. <laughs> and I was always taught in medical school, just like he's saying on the slide, don't take iodine. Under any conditions, you don't need iodine. If you take iodine, you're going to precipitate a thyroid problem. If you have a thyroid problem and taking iodine, you're going to make that thyroid problem worse. Now. I was scared of iodine when I finished medical school, and I didn't want to use it, and I thought there was enough iodine and salt. Um, but boy, was I taught the wrong information about iodine. There's not enough iodine and salt. Um, 97, over 96% of the population is deficient in iodine, and iodine deficiency is associated with thyroid diseases, including autoimmune thyroid disease, thyroid cancer, breast diseases, including fibrocystic breast and breast cancer, um, autoimmune disease in general, and a whole host of other problems, including cancers of the ovaries, the uterus, um, and of course, the thyroid and the breast. So, Professor Vader was telling me don't take iodine, um, but uh, when I wrote my first edition of my book uh, on iodine, he read it and he wasn't feeling so well and he came to me and here's what he looked like when he came to me and you can see from this picture <laughs> that his hair had fallen out, he had these dark circles under his eyes, and. Um, he didn't look very healthy and he was grouchy and irritable and you know didn't really seem to like anything or anybody at that point point. and I tested an iodine level on him he was very low I put him on a small amount of iodine and here's the results his hair grew back he got color back to his face he became less irritable and if iodine can do this to Professor Vader iodine can ha certainly help you in your lifestyle so I'd like to start off with quoting my mentor in iodine, Dr. Abraham, who, who, who developed a term called medical iodophobia. It's the unwarranted fear of using and recommending inorganic non-radioactive iodine within the range known from the collective experience of three generations of clinicians to be the safest and most effective amounts for treating the symptoms and signs of iodine deficiency somewhere between 12 and, and 50 milligrams per day. Now, the RDA for iodine, or the RDI, you know, the new term for it, is about 150 micrograms per day. That's 100 to 500 times lower than what Dr. Abraham has coined here. And 
either Dr. Abraham is way off base or the RDA is way off base. And I'll side with the RDA being way off base and I'll show you the research behind that. So this is the illness that's affecting medical students, it's affecting residents, it's affecting doctors, it's affecting the public, it's affecting the media. Once we overcome this medical iodophobia illness, then we can be comfortable with taking iodine and ensuring we all have adequate iodine intakes. Edgar Casey, the sleeping prophet, said there are only four elements in the body, water, salt, soda, and iodine. If we have adequate amounts of these four elements in balance, the body is fully capable of creating all the other elements of the universe. I couldn't agree with Mr. Casey more. Um, we need adequate hydration. We need the right kind of salt in the diet. And if you're not taking an unrefined salt, by my definition, you're salt deficient. Salt deficiency leads to problems with the thyroid, the adrenals, the immune system. You can't detox without adequate amounts of salt. I'll talk, touch on salt in this lecture, but I have another talk on salt and another book on salt, if you're interested more in that. Um, you need adequate amounts of iodine, which we're going to talk about now. And what I think he meant by soda was perhaps uh, you need your one Diet Coke a day. Um, if it's not Diet Coke a day, uh, he could have been referring to getting the pH balanced. Um, with bicarbonate of soda, which is what I think he was actually referring to here. So this is a thyroid ultrasound report on a patient where I palpated some nodules in her thyroid. I sent her for an ultrasound, and the ultrasound it reads here that one of the nodules is greater than one centimeter in size, and anything greater than one centimeter in size I sent for a biopsy to rule out thyroid cancer. This patient didn't want a biopsy for thyroid cancer. She was very iodine deficient. I put her on iodine. Um, you can see the data on this is 5 of 04 between 5 of 04 and 11 of 04, this next ultrasound, it's the impression was previously described nodules not identified in the current exam. This never happened to me until I started using iodine in my practice. Iodine deficiency causes cysts. If, if it goes on, the cysts become nodular. If it goes on, the nodular cysts become fibrotic. If it goes on, the fibrotic cysts become cancer. And this occurs in the thyroid, the breasts, the uterus, the ovaries, and probably the prostate. Um, and all the endocrine tissues can form cancer like this. The only cure for this is iodine deficiency. Um, so this is a routine in my practice now where ultrasounds of the breasts and the ovaries and the uterus and the prostate showing nodules and cysts and enlargements and, and irregular tissue become normal between six months and a year later. And only iodine can do this. No drug can do this. No other nutritional therapy can do this. So I was taught in medical school don't give them iodine. <clears throat> if they have thyroid problems, the iodine's going to make it worse. If they don't have thyroid problems, you're going to precipitate it. Well, this study showed that compared to normal thyroid tissue, benign thyroid nodules contain only 56% of the iodine content as the normal thyroid tissue. They also showed that malignant thyroid nodules contain only 3% of the iodine content as compared to normal thyroid tissue. If iodine were causing nodules and causing malignant tissue, you would expect the opposite to occur. Now, it's not just iodine. I don't suggest that you go and start using iodine alone. I suggest you work with a healthcare provider knowledgeable with iodine. But it, used, it needs to be used as part of a holistic treatment regimen. And one of the things is selenium. Um, so in this study, malignant thyroid nodules contain only 68% of the selenium content as compared to normal thyroid tissue. If we have time in this talk, I'll show you the relationship between selenium and iodine and why they should frequently be used together for thyroid problems. This is the periodic table. We're going to focus on group 17, the halides, fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodine. So the, the history of iodine was first discovered in 1811. It's known the, as the birth of Western medicine. Boos and Galt in 1824 observed that goiter did not occur in silver mining sites, and he also observed that those that came into the silver mining sites with goiter, when they would drink the water from the mines, their goiter would go away. Now, he ascertained the substance in the mine was iodine that was causing the goiter to go away. He wrote an article about it. He suggested anyone with goiter to use iodine, or iodine containing water, or iodine containing salt. Now, it was really the first time that a single item iodine was recommended for a single problem goiter. And as I previously mentioned, what was I taught in medical school? I was taught how to make a diagnosis and how to prescribe the one drug to treat that diagnosis. So therefore, iodine is known as the birth of Western medicine as Boos and Galt recommended iodine for treating goiter back in 1824. Now, unfortunately, it took the United States 100 years to heed his advice. Um, so I always make the statement that the FDA is 100 years behind what's really true out there, um, and nothing has really changed in the last couple of hundred years. 
So the RDA for iodine, I'm not sure if the RDA stands for Rats, Drugs, and Assumptions or Really Dumb Advice, but the RDA for iodine is probably for Rats, Drugs, and Assumptions because it's enough for rats to maintain normal thyroid function and to give iodine for the rest of their tissue, but it's certainly not enough for us humans in the toxic environment we live in today, and I'll show you that. But here's the RDA for iodine, about 150 micrograms a day for the adult male and female, a little bit more for pregnancy and lactation. Now, iodized salt was introduced in the United States in the 1920s to prevent goiter. Since that time, conventional medicine has been adamant. There's enough iodine and salt. You don't need to supplement anybody with iodine. Now, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey is done by the U.S. government every 10 years, and they look at a cross-section of about 8,000 people. They draw various vitamin, mineral, vitamin, mineral, and some toxic element levels, and they extrapolate those numbers out nationally. From 1970 to 2000, the government's own data showed iodine levels declined 50% in the United States. So we need to think about that. We've had iodine salt the whole time. Why is iodine level declined 50%? And what are the consequences of that? During this time that iodine levels declined 50% in the United States from 1970 to 2000, there's been significant increases in the incidence of all the thyroid illnesses, thyroid cancer, autoimmune thyroid disorders such as Hashimoto's and Graves' disease, as well as hypothyroidism. Just the opposite of what I was taught in medical school since they said that iodine caused these problems. Well, during the same time iodine levels have fallen 50%, cancer of the breast, prostate, endometrium, and ovaries, all increasing at near epidemic rates, particularly for breast and prostate, those are at epidemic rates across the United States, as one in seven women have breast cancer, one in three men have prostate cancer. Now, all of those ab of conditions can be caused by iodine deficiency. Again, pretty much the opposite of what I was taught in medical school. The proportion of the U.S. population with moderate to severe iodine deficiency, as, as defined by the World Health Organization, has increased 400% in the last 20 years, from 2% in, in 1970 to about 11.7% in, in 1990. In 2000, it was up to 16.8%, moderately to severely iodine deficient. And where are we in 2009? And this graph can give you an idea of where do you think things are going if we don't make some changes. This is why I think the health care plan is just doomed to fail. We're, we're missing the basic tenets of health care, which is diet, um, diet and exercise, and nutritional support for the body. So this is an article from Family Practice News, a recent article. Many pregnant women may be deficient in iodine. So the authors go through these studies that I've just quoted for you, and they make a claim that more than 70% of women with access to dietary iodine may remain at risk for unrecognized iodine deficiency during pregnancy. I'll show you that this unrecognized iodine deficiency risk is leading to lower IQ scores, more ADD, more health problems in our children, and it's going to compound the problems as they age. So this was, a, this was a fairly new study, and what the authors did was look at three groups of children. Group one were supplemented with iodine at 200 micrograms per day, um, which is the, the RDI for iodine um, for pregnancy. And they were supplemented at 200 micrograms per day at four to six weeks of gestational age. So the mothers were, mothers were just pregnant. Group two, the mothers were supplemented with the same amount of iodine at 12 to 14 weeks of gestational age, so the second trimester. Group three, they were not given iodine supplementation during the whole gestation, gestation. They were supplemented with the same amount of iodine after delivery. All the children were given a neurocognitive evaluation at 18 months of age. Um, and all the, all the groups, all the mothers were supplemented with iodine until the end of lactation. So here's the data on this study. Um, group three we'll start with first. These were the group of women not supplemented with iodine until after pregnancy. You can see from this slide that the first and the second columns, less than 0.82 thyroid hormone, were uh, make up about 40%. So